2018 meeting of the Palm Springs City Council. Would everyone pre please rise and join us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Please place your hand over your heart and repeat with me. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. You may be seated. City Clerk, would you do the roll call, please? Councilmember Holstech? Present. Councilmember Kors? Here. Councilmember Middleton? Present. Mayor Pro Tem Roberts? Present. Mayor Moon? Present. All council is present. Thank you very much. Next item is presentations. Dr. Reddy? Mayor, I believe there's one presentation, and uh, you have the honor, sir. Ah, yeah. So, would the rest of the council come down here with me on the on the floor, and we'll present this very important, very nice new plaque. Okay, Denise gave me my instructions here, so. Uh, she said, briefly, talk about 1PS, that, uh, and 1PS is so important to this city of Palm Springs, comprised of 45 organized neighborhoods, and tonight we're going to be presenting this plaque, which, uh, which congratulates and commemorates the first six presidents of the, of the, of the 1PS, which we used to know as Pisnik, and 1PS sounds so much more dignified. But I, I know from personal experience uh, how important this is to all of us in the city. I know of these last six, I actually served as a uh, neighborhood commissioner, or uh, mid-neighborhood representative for four of the last ones. And I know I learned so much. And I always warn people in neighborhood organizations, they have to be careful that being on a, on a Pisnik representative is like being uh, is like a gateway drug. Right, Lisa? Because you never know where you're going to end up. So, uh, and... Uh, we have this beautiful plaque tonight, and I'd like to invite those, who, those former presidents of, uh, chairpersons of 1PS who are here tonight, Phil Strout, I believe is here, the current president. And Lisa Middleton, is she in the audience here somewhere? Oh, oh there she is. Jim Gross. Uh, Kevin Towner, who's not here with us tonight, and John Williams. And Bob Malowitz, who is not here with us tonight. So we have four of our, 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 our uh, former chairpersons. So with that, I would like to present this plaque. And it will go on, uh, hopefully, some very nice spot out in the lobby or somewhere. Uh, Dr. Reddy will find a good spot for it. Mm -hmm. Yes, Denise, thank you. Uh, organized Neighborhoods of Palm Springs Chairpersons Honor Roll. These individuals served as chairpersons on behalf of the organized neighborhoods and residents of the city of Palm Springs. Their outstanding leadership improved the quality of life for residents and visitors to our great city. Prior to 2014, the organization was the Palm Springs Neighborhood Involvement Committee, PISNIC. So with that, I'd like to present this plaque. And And I believe uh, our current president, Phil's chairperson, Phil Stroud, wanted to say a few words. Good evening. Uh, on behalf of 1PS, I want to thank the city council for, for its continuing ongoing support of, of uh, 1PS. Uh, you're really a vital part. You know, we enjoy our relationship with the city council. And council member Middleton is the liaison between the city council and 1PS. And each month she attends and participates in our meeting, meeting which greatly uh, strengthens our relationship with the city. As well, I should also point out that Mayor 
Moon regularly attends our meetings and we really appreciate that. The, and other city people do also. David Reddy attends our meetings and always gives a nice address. Members of the Palm Springs Fire Department and Police Department give a monthly review at each meeting. I also really want to thank uh, and point out the contribution of uh, the head of the Office of Neighborhood Involvement, Denise uh, Goosley. Goosley, where are you? Thank you so much. Thank you, Denise. Also, Jasmine White, you know, with the Parks and Recreation does so much for us. Finally, I, it's my pleasure to uh, thank Bob Farron, who is the events committee person for P 1PS, and uh, he's responsible for getting this plaque donated and for the whole event tonight. So again, thank you all. Hey, thank you, Phil. Dr. Reddy, any other presentations? Oh, no, Mayor. Okay, seeing none, the next item is acceptance of the agenda. The City Council will discuss the order of the agenda, may amend the order and add urgency items, note abstentions or no votes on consent calendar items and request consent calendar items to be removed from the consent calendar for discussion. I would like to entertain a motion for acceptance of the agenda. Are there any items any council member would like removed from the consent calendar for a separate discussion and or vote? Mayor Pro Tem Roberts. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, I'd like to remove one. Just all of them. One, well, I'm sorry, one B. One so B. So B, I'd like to remove, and I, yes, let's just <laughs> remove all of them. We do anyway. Um, and, I, and F. One B and one F. I had F, okay. Council Member Coors. Um, I'd like to remove one H. And um, I think I can just record a no vote on one A without having to pull it. If that's correct, yes? Yes. Okay. Councilmember Middleton. I'm going to uh, pull 1A, and I've already, uh, and Mayor Pro Tim Roberts pulled 1F, which I was going to pull. Councilmember Holstage. Thank you. Mine were already pulled. Okay, do we have a motion to accept the agenda as amended with the following items pulled from the consent calendar? 1A, 1B, 1F, and 1H. I believe that was all of them. Motion to approve is made by Councilmember Kors, seconded by Councilmember Holsters. Motion is on the floor. <clears throat> motion passes five to zero. Mr. Cockin, could you please give a report of the closed session? Thank you, Mr. Mayor, members of the council. Uh, our closed session agenda was as usual ambitious. We did cover, uh, but not complete our consideration of the named item of anticipation, anticipated litigation. We also covered three additional matters in closed session. And we also covered the labor negotiations. Uh, and we also covered the uh, real property negotiations regarding the community housing Opportunities Corporation. Uh, the balance of the closed session agenda we did not get to. Uh, there was no reportable action taken on any of the items considered to this point. And if the council chooses later to readjourn to closed session, that'll be within the council's uh, purview. Thank you, Mr. Calkin. Thank you. Uh, the next item, public testimony. Public testimony for non-public hearing agenda items only. This time has been set aside for members of the public to address the City Council only on non-public hearing agenda items. Two minutes will be assigned to each speaker. You are asked to begin your, name by t your time by telling us what agenda item or items you are speaking about. To remind, testimony for public hearings will only be taken at the time of the public hearing, and general public comments for subjects that are not on tonight's agenda will be taken later in the hearing. So right now I have three people who have requested to speak. First is Jeff Clarkson followed by Raymond Lamy, and then Daryl Terrell. If anyone else wishes to speak, please put a card in to Mr. Mejia at this time, the city clerk. I'm sorry. Oh. Yeah. Is this okay? There it is, you're okay. on. Okay, all right. Uh, so this is on item 3A. Uh, my name is Jeff Clarkson. I'm a resident representing Palm Springs on the Palm Springs International Airport Commission. I'm speaking in opposition to the amendment you're considering tonight that would allow non-residents to chair this important commission. 
The law currently requires that a Palm Springs representative chair the Palm Springs International Airport Commission. This requirement is a no-brainer to me. Uh, there's no reason to change it. The airport is owned and operated by the city of Palm Springs, not other cities. When it's time to issue bonds for the airport's growth, provide security at the airport, and maintain airport property, just to name a few examples, those resources come from the city of Palm Springs. Other desert cities certainly have an interest in the airport and a need for the airport prosper, but they don't have the vested interest or the ultimate responsibility for the airport that the city of Palm Springs has. These other cities already have representation on the commission, but they shouldn't be in charge. The only justification cited in your staff report for the amendment is that the current airport commission voted to recommend it. That is true. However, there are a couple of things that you should know about that vote that aren't mentioned in your staff report. First, there are two vacancies on the airport commission. Both of those are representative from Palm Springs. These unfilled vacancies give non-Palm Springs residents a majority on the Palm Springs International Airport Commission. So what you have is a majority of non-residents recommending what you, the Palm Springs City Council, should do with the Palm Springs Ordinance. I suppose if I were a representative from one of these other cities, I'd vote to recommend this change as well, but I'm not. Like you, I represent the City of Palm Springs. Second, you should know that the majority of Palm Springs rep representatives on the Airport Commission, that is, a majority of your constituents on the Commission, voted against the recommendation. You now have the final decision. I hope you decide that the chairperson of the Palm Springs International Airport Commission should be a Palm Springs representative like the chairpersons of all the other Palm Springs commissions. And boards. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Clarkson. Our next speaker is Raymond Lamy and then Daryl Terrell. Mr. Lamy is also speaking on item 3A. Good evening, City Council and everyone else here. My name is Ray Lamy and I'm a resident of Palm Springs. Specifically, I live in the P.S. Colony neighborhood, whose southeast corner is near Sunrise Way and Via Escuela. The P.S. Colony neighborhood is in the direct northerly flight path of the Palm Springs International Airport. I recently heard that the Palm Springs City Council was considering allowing residents of other valid Valley Desert cities to lead the Palm Springs International Airport Commission. And my initial reaction was, wait, what? I do appreciate that these other cities utilize the airport, but having a Palm Springs resident to lead the airport commission seemed to me to be a given. The other Valley Desert cities have representatives on the commission, which seems perfectly sufficient. My main concern with the airport, as it is for many Palm Springs residents, is the noise it generates. I realize that not only does Palm Springs depend on the airport for economic health and growth, but the valley, the entire valley does as well. I'm not anti-growth for the valley, but I am hopeful, no, I actually expect, that the desire for growth is managed with the needs of Palm Springs residents in mind for a peaceful and pleasant place to live. As an example, I bought my home in early 2017, and I was aware it was in the flight path, but I wasn't fully aware of what living in the flight, the flight path meant until I moved in. You can't leave the windows open at night as early morning flights, originally starting around 6.40 a.m., would wake you up. I have to keep a loud fan on in my bedroom to drown out the jet engine noise, and that's with the windows closed. Secondly, recent morning flights are now as early as 5.15 a.m. I won't even get into the military jet engine noise with sound house because I know you have no control over that. My point is the leadership of the airport commission should not only be sensitive to the needs of the traveling public, the local business community, and the valley, but also the residents who make the city their home. I'm not sure that a, that a chair of the airport commission who resides in another desert city without the airport in his or her backyard can be as sensitive to the needs of local residents for other issues as well as someone who lives in Palm Springs. I strongly believe the chair of the Palm Springs International Airport Commission should be someone who represents Palm Springs by residing in Palm Springs. Thank you, Mr. Lemmy. Your time is up. Next speaker is Daryl Terrell on item 1H. My name is Daryl Terrell. I'm from Moreno Valley. I'm in support of a, of a friend of the court belief that you have signed. We wouldn't need a SB 54 if the politicians in Washington would put their personal differences aside to fix a broken immigration system that has been used to tear families apart, to demonize them, to divide, and to inflame people. It doesn't have to be that way. We have to appeal not to people's fears, 
but to their hopes, to their highest ideals, because that's who we are as a people. It's been inscribed on our nation's seal since we declared our independence. E pluris unum, out of many, one. That is what has drawn the persecuted, the impoverished to our shores. That's what led innovators and risk takers from around the world to take a chance in a land called hope. That's what, what has led people to brave hardships and great risk to reach our shores in search of a better life for themselves and their families in a place where they could be at last, free to work and worship and live their lives as they want it to be. We are only here because this country welcomed our forebearers and taught them that being an American is, a, is about more than what we look like or where we came from. What makes us Americans is our shared commitment to an idea that all of us in this room or watching on TV are, are, here, are here in this together. We rise and fall together as one people and one community. That's the country we inherit, and, it, and this is the one we have to leave for future generations. Thank you, Mr. Terrell. Okay, any other speakers, uh, city clerk? No other speakers. Seeing none, we will close the first session of uh, public speaking. Next item uh, is the consent calendar. Item, oh, wait a minute, sorry. Going a little fast here is something. We have city council subcommittee, uh, Council and city manager's comments and report. City manager, do you have any comments or reports? Uh, Mayor, ready to move on with the balance of the agenda. Thank you. Thank you. Council Member Middleton. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, you were in the it was a, uh, a holiday week, so we didn't have quite as many uh, subcommittee meetings and the like as we usually do. But uh, I want to br uh, bring up a couple of uh, meetings that did occur. One was with uh, Council Member Holstage and I, and that was an affordable housing ad hoc subcommittee. And uh, we will be asking uh, staff to schedule as soon as possible a public meeting of the affordable housing uh, subcommittee to review in many issues with regard to affordable housing, but uh, four in particular. The proposed uh, chalk project that would be at uh, San Rafael and uh, Indian Canyon, a survey of all of the properties that are in Palm Springs that are potentially available for affordable housing, a review of Senator Scott Weiner's uh, SB 35 bill, which will create a much more streamlined process for uh, processing affordable housing projects. And lastly, uh, what incentives should we be providing as a city for those who are going to build affordable housing? I will remind everyone again, the League of California Cities has estimated that in California, we should be building 180,000 new housing units a year and are currently building approximately 90,000 uh, units at that rate. Our housing crisis in California will only continue to grow and it is incumbent on every city in our state to take affirmative measures to ensure that we are building the affordable housing uh, that we need for our population. Uh, Moving on, uh, I'm a member of the Coachella Valley uh, Mountain Conservancy, and I want to uh, bring to your attention a couple of issues that came up at the most recent uh, uh, meeting of the uh, Mountain Conservancy. Uh, one, we approved uh, a purchase for $1.3, almost $1.4 million of 480 acres uh, that are right on the border of Palm Springs. This is at uh, Snow Creek and Windy Point, it is just south of the 110-111 uh, junction, and that will provi permanently provide uh, greater open space for our community. Uh, the Mountain Conservancy approved uh, the following primary systems for determining what projects should be built, and that is to enhance access to open to outdoor recreation areas, 
preserve cultural and historic resources, respond to climate change, protect natural resources, and lastly, that at least 20% of grants should be for projects that, sever, that serve severely disadvantaged communities. Uh, another issue that came up at the uh, CVMC, and this is an unusual one, and I, but I want to point it out for our community. Uh, a few years ago, uh, remains were uncovered on private property. Uh, human remains, uh, tests were done, and it was determined that these were human remains of uh, ancient uh, tribal members of the Agua Caliente uh, tribe going back uh, thousands of years, as we know. Uh, those remains were transported to a museum in uh, Los Angeles. The Agua Caliente tribe has made a request of the Mountain Conservancy that the remains be uh, buried somewhere as close as possible on public land to the, uh, where the remains were found and in a place that would be completely unmarked and unknown to anyone in the public so that they can rest uh, forever as closely as possible to where they or were originally found. It was uh, one of the uh, better moments serving on any commission uh, to be a part of the unanimous vote uh, to restore those remains to where they uh, rightfully belong. Uh, lastly, uh, uh, just a personal note, uh, I'm gonna ask to uh, reluctantly step down from uh, the Mountain Conservancy at the end of uh, this year because I'm going to be serving in a capacity with the League of California Cities and there are sometimes conflicts with uh, those meetings. Uh, and so I'll give a heads up to anyone who wants to step up for that really important role. I, in looking though, as we will be soon at uh, our standing committees, I took a note uh, today, we have 14 standing committees, 47 ad hoc committees, six project representative uh, appointments, and 20 separate commissions and organizations that city council members are responsible for. And before we get into the process of who is going to be on which for the upcoming year, I would like to recommend that uh, we have a, another subcommittee uh, take a look at how many of these we can streamline and make recommendations to uh, back to the full council to see if we cannot uh, make this workload not only just a little bit easier on all of us, but most importantly, uh, a whole lot easier on city staff that has to provide us with the work uh, and the reports and things to make all of these various committees go, uh, go around. With that, I'll close my report. And by the way, I'm willing to serve on that uh, subcommittee. <clears throat> Councilmember Coors. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, just a few things. Um, first, I was at the Desert Community um, Energy uh, Joint Power Authority uh, Board meeting, which we did up at the Sentinel Power Plant. And pretty much in the next three, first three months of next year, we'll be making a decision on potential launch dates um, of that program. So we just went through a lot of data, cost of power, various um, items. So I'll have more to report back probably in the first quarter of next year on the status of that. Um, as a member of the districting subcommittee, um, uh, city clerk uh, Mejia and I presented at the Palm Springs Hospitality Association luncheon uh, to get input on the various maps from them. I think the thing that uh, we got back at that as we have at most of the meetings we've had with business organizations, is they don't seem to have much of a preference as far as um, whether one, two, or more people uh, represent the central business district, that they didn't feel that was really relevant. And we know in, from the reports of other cities, some cities, business districts felt it was imperative that every single member touched on the downtown, uptown type area. They have no preference. So I just want to share that since tomorrow at 6 p.m. We'll we do plan to select a map. So I want to remind people of that. 
This morning, the city clerk, council member Middleton and I um, went to the Palm Springs Realtors Association breakfast um, and sort of went through the items that are in the staff report for tomorrow that you'll see. And they, um, over 100 people, and they voted um, unanimously over 100 people to recommend Little Middleton Test 2 map, 6-2 I believe is the proper number, Middleton Test 6-2 or something. Um, and we received a letter from their president, George Ryder, on that, which um, I think the city clerk has received as well. So just remind people tomorrow at 6. Last thing I have, which will go, because I know Councilman uh, Mayor Pro Tem Roberts is next and wants to report on this, is the vacation rental um, ad hoc on the vacation rental ordinance updates has met. And just to let people know that on December 11th, from 3 to 5 p.m., we will be meeting to discuss it with stakeholders, any resident, anyone who wants to come here in the chambers. That's all I have, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Mayor Pro Tem. Um, um, okay, I don't need to talk about vacation. So I'm going to talk. And the downtown subcommittee met with uh, Michael Braun, developer of the downtown project, made a proposal to us that we listened to, but nothing more to report on that. Um, we asked for more information. And um, so right now there's nothing really to bring to the city council on that. And the developer asks that the proposal itself remain um, confidential. So we will be honoring that um, until such time there's a reason to bring it to the city council and to the public. Um, I serve on the, uh, uh, on the for CVAG, uh, Public Safety and Transportation Subcommittee um, for the county. And um, somehow the conversation went toward homelessness. And the reason it went toward homelessness is that uh, the county submitted its draft housing plan. And um, the presentation was okay. Obviously, this is very important to us because we're looking at a tremendous amount of funding coming from the state. So it's vital that the county uh, and, and and we as well have a plan uh, for the use of those dollars so that we can get our share of it and our uh, our um, our homeless, homelessness committee can spend those dollars as quickly as possible to make a difference in our homeless community. The the um, the. The housing plan that we saw was, um, the presentation was a quick presentation, so we didn't get all the details. Um, but one of the issues that came up was that money could be spent towards um, giving landlords incentives to, to rent to, to homeless people. And one of the ways that they think of doing that is offering housing vouchers, which is not a new concept. Um, my concern with this this plan is that uh, you know we're in an extremely tight rental market in general, especially here in the Coachella Valley, and the th the things that really um, would keep landlords from wanting to do that is that or landlords from wanting to bring in homelessness, even if we made it financially positive for them, is the nimbyism that they're going to face. And I think that any housing plan whatsoever from the county, from us, from the state, has to include a very clear path to dealing with neighborhoods so that landlords or others that are willing to bring homeless people into their places and put a roof over their head aren't going to be attacked or be afraid to do it because their neighbors are going to be upset about it. So I think that's as important to address as anything else we do, because I see that as a potential roadblock. I asked that question at that CVAC meeting, and it seemed to be a new concept. And that concerned me. I believe our own housing, uh, our own homelessness subcommittee has probably considered this, and I know that they have, but I think that it is something that we need to have a much bigger conversation with when it comes to the county itself. Um, you know, notwithstanding um, SB 35, which has, was mentioned earlier tonight, which streamlines the process for builders to, to build um, affordable housing, um, which ultimately we hope will include homeless as well, um, the, NIMI, the NIMI issue is a major, major issue. And it's a very real issue on both sides. And... Um, 
The other thing that wasn't really talked about, and, and I know our own subcommittee is working on diligently, is coming up with a cafeteria of incentives to get builders to actually want to build affordable housing. And until we can make that pot sweet enough for them to consider that, we're not going to see it. There's no reason for them. They can build um, all the condominiums they want. In this day and age in Palm Springs, most of those condominiums sell before they even are built. And nobody wants to build apartments anymore because there's not anywhere near as much money in it. And we need to change that. We need to flip that. So as I mentioned before, we did that with hotels. No hotels had been built in Palm Springs in 35 years until our former council and, and, our, and our great city manager and staff came up with a plan and a financial incentive for hotels to come back and build in Palm Springs. We have seen a major boom from that. We are all now benefiting from that in an enormous way on many levels. So we need to have an incentive program that is as powerful as the hotel incentive program. And I, I've asked for this before and I, and I, yes, I'm going to badger our affordable housing subcommittee to get, to that, get that back to us as soon as they can, because I have to tell you, I'm here for another year and I'm excited about this and I'm really anxious to see us roll out a plan that can be a model plan for other cities, if not the state. And um, you already gave the date for vacation rental. We're very excited. We're rolling out ordinance 2.0 on our vacation rental ordinance. This has been something that's been in the works since we wrote the original vacation rental ordinance. And there are some substantial changes. So we invite those that care about the vacation rental ordinance to, to come on uh, December 11th, three to five. We're having it in here. So we have the room and we have a place for the press as well who I'm pretty certain we'll want to come as well. And that's what I have, Mayor. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'd like to add to some uh, add on to segue into what Councilmember Middleton said on the on on item five under here on a new business or item five A on uh, ad hocs and, and sub on uh, uh, boards and commissions. One of the recommendations is that the council should really pass some of these ad hoc duties that we do to the boards and commissions and ask them to take these on and come back to the council with recommendations. So I think as we look at uh, reducing the number of ad hocs and subcommittees, we should really take that into consideration. And uh, I've got some bandwidth, so uh, Councilman Middleton, if you'd like, I'd, li I'd like to work with you on, on, on that project if it's okay. Okay, so Mayor, I will appoint I'm just, us. I'm sitting here laughing. I'm not laughing at you. I'm laughing because the two of you brought this up and it's, when I think of the things that we try to accomplish and the walls that we try to scale, the concept of actually reducing <laughs> subcommittees and ad hoc committees, do you know how long we've been talking about trying to do that? And what we always do when we have this conversation, by the way, is we add to them, we never reduce them. Well, I think one thing we should look at is trying to delegate some, see which, I'd like to look to see which one of these ad hocs we could delegate to one of our 15 boards and commissions, because they're, they've got people that are anxious to work and they're, they're, they're close to the residents and they know, that I think they'd be a great resource. Okay, no, council, so we'll do that then, clerk, city clerk. Hey, Councilmember Member Holstage. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'll just be very brief. Uh, though I did have a, have a request for the Mayor Pro Tem, um, could you add that housing plan from the county as received to f and file for the next council meeting so that we can review that? Because I haven't seen it yet, and I think the public would be interested in the county plan. A lot of this is at the county level. We've talked a lot about that the county has the responsibility for um, doing housing and social services and homelessness, and the city has stepped up in a lot of those areas um, as well because our residents have demanded it. Um, so I think our residents would be really interested in that. Um, and we are working on those requests, Mayor Pro Tem, and we will bring those forward on the affordable housing incentives for landlords. Um, relatedly, Councilmember Kors and I um, just met with the Desert Healthcare District as part of our homelessness ad hoc uh, subcommittee, and they hired, and I was actually really proud to be a part of this, that um, Desert Healthcare District hired a national level consultant on homelessness named Barbara Poppy, and she just uh, released, so she spent months 
months and months assessing um, the data and um, what existing services there are on homelessness for the entire Coachella Valley. And um, we just got that report from them as well. Um, it was from the Desert Healthcare District. So we'll also submit that um, to council so that the community can review it. They have a lot of good recommendations and a lot of suggestions about things that we can do here in Palm Springs um, to continue to be a leader on homelessness for the entire Coachella Valley. It's really a regional issue and we have to work regionally and that's why this Desert Healthcare District um, project was so important. One request I have, um, I've made this request but I wanna put a timeline on it, is the um, California Voting Rights Act Working Group made recommendations um, that in addition to moving to districts that would remove the barriers um, for people running for office. And I think we need to do those this year or in January as soon as possible. Because you can hear we have 55 sub committees. This is a full-time job, um, though Though we pay um, council $29,000 a year uh, to do the full-time job, um, which we're all so grateful to serve. Um, but people need to know what kind of other um, support they're gonna get if we're gonna make changes so that working people um, and others can, can really meaningfully participate and run and serve. I think people need to have those recommendations um, before and, and actually instituted um, before they decide to run. Um, one request that I wanted to bring up to my council to start thinking about, because I know in our last budget, um, you know, and I talked a little bit about the, the workload for um, the council, and we really um, have uh, one administrative assistant for all of us who does our scheduling. Um, and I know for me alone, like the amount of emails that I get um, is just really um, extensive. It's it's a huge amount of work just to get um, through my emails. I think it's probably, I think the mayor's has said he spends 20 hours a week uh, responding to emails. Um, and so I know we budgeted for a legislative aid for the council, but I think the council in including the California Voting Rights Act uh, working group recommendations should talk about um, staffing for the city council as well. If it's a legislative person, if it's an additional administrative person, we'll talk to the city manager about that um, because I think you know our residents demand a high quality of service I want to give that to them um, I want to respond to every email within a day um, and I, we need more staff support to really provide that quality of service to our residents um, who deserve it so that's my request if we could get our head around that and um, when we bring it forward um, just one fun update Council member, as, as you know from the last meeting, um, we had the Desert Learning Academy fourth grade students come and talk to us about um, bringing forward um, an ordinance and resolution about plastic waste, plastic straws, styrofoam, and the like, and they were um, amazing when they came here, and we went to them uh, last night um, with we went with them to the Palm Springs Unified School District Board and they presented there as well. Um, and they asked them to do the same. So the school district serves 4.4 million meals every year uh, and has a huge ability to impact. I think they, they've um, stopped using plastic straws, but they still use single use plastics like forks and trays and things like that and all of those meals. So um, they've now expanded their advocacy and that was really fun to watch. Um, and and it's an invitation to the council that we're gonna go, all the council's invited on December 5th to the classroom at Desert Learning Academy in the morning. Um, and they wanna actually, they've done uh, scientific surveys about uh, plastic waste and they want to present uh, their findings to us on December 5th. So we're gonna do that, um, whoever would like to join us as a council. I know the mayor pro tem is really interested in that. Quick question, can we, since it's not gonna be legislator or anything, can we have more than two there? Yes, I believe we can. Mr. City Calkin. Attorney, we can have more than two council members because we're not gonna be deliberating. We're just going to be receiving their report. You're, I'm sorry, I was working on something. You're attending which function? We're going to the Desert Learning Academy for them to present um, their school findings on the straw and plastic no waste. We can all attend. I want to make it clear. I just wanted to give you a real legal opinion and not mine. Thank you. Um, <laughs> 
And that's all I have. Um, just for the community, we have our holiday tree lighting um, this Friday at 4.30. And we also have the Festival of Lights Parade um, this weekend. So I hope everyone, we will be walking in it. It'll be great for the city. Um, hope you all can attend. So thank you. That's all I have, Mr. Mayor. Okay, thank you. Next item is the consent calendar. Uh, I will entertain the motion to accept the consent calendar without items 1A, 1B, 1F, 1H. Motion to approve made by Mayor Pro Tem Roberts, seconded by Council Member Coors. Motion is on the floor. Motion passes five to zero. Okay, thank you. The first item is item 1A, second reading and adoption of ordinance number 1968, repealing Palm Springs Municipal Code section 11.16.040. Council Member Middleton. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, this will be very brief. Uh, we have repealed the our reporting requirement, and I voted with that uh, repeal solely for one reason. And uh, we always get emails, uh, but this one is a really sensitive subject uh, with me. Uh, and uh, someone congratulated me uh, for voting uh, to repeal a gun uh, safety measure and uh, it struck a chord. So I'm gonna repeat it again. Uh, what is changed here is the state of California has acted. The state of California reporting requirement is five days as opposed to 48 hours in Palm Springs. Uh, I am willing to support consistency uh, in reporting requirements statewide because that enhances understanding uh, we still reside in a country where the United States Congress refuses to act responsibly to provide safety on the handling of guns and access to guns in our country. And until the United States Congress acts, cities and states throughout this country are going to be forced to act on their own. And I am incredibly proud that my city is one of those cities that acted uh, to promote gun safety and to do a better job of protecting our citizens than unfortunately our Congress has done. Hmm. Anyway, Mayor Pro Tem? In responding to uh, Councilwoman Middleton's comments, I just want to say that I voted for exactly the same reasons. Um, I think it was Councilman Coors and I worked on that original legislation uh, or that original policy um, where we um, we brought some level of, of, of gun control here to Palm Springs, as minimal as it was, and we took a tremendous hit for it. Uh, the, at least I can say personally, the National Rifle Association uh, threatened my career, uh, my car got keyed, my building got egged, I got multiple threats on Facebook. Um, that's never happened to me in my entire career in public service. So um, it naturally just made me want to enact more gun control. So in case anybody's confused, we repealed that for consistency with the state because the state's doing what we wanted to do. And that's all that's about. Um, we didn't repeal it because we wanted to repeal any sort of gun control whatsoever. We're on the flip side of that. We believe in more gun control, or at least in a country where it doesn't exist, some gun control. So thank you. Um, are we moving on to B? No, no, okay. we have to vote. Well. And Council, uh, you, uh, Council McCors? Um, thank you, Mayor. Um, you know, I voted no on this last time, and I will again. I very much respect my colleagues on this. I think every single person up here is, feels very strongly on this. Where just my view is different is that our ordinance was effective. We had over 60 people report lost or stolen guns. And while I appreciate the state acted after us, um, I don't like being bullied by the gun lobby and we had free pro bono counsel representing us. And so for those reasons, I do not want to repeal this. But I very much respect the decision of the majority. I think, you know, 
the mayor, Mayor Pro Tem, and I all voted for this and the gun safety ordinance. Um, but I just want to explain why I'm voting differently, but it's not for a different agreement on where we all stand on this issue. And I appreciate that. <clears throat> okay, do we have a motion to approve? Motion to approve made by Mayor Pro Tem Roberts, seconded by Councilmember Middleton. Motion is on the floor. Motion passes three to two. Thank you. Next item 1B, uh, Palm Springs Innovation Hub and Accelerator Campus Quarterly Report for July 1st, 2018 to September 30, 2018. Mayor Pro Tem Roberts. Uh, thank you, Mayor. The reason I pulled this is I, I have some questions with respect to um, measurability and the success of iHub. So, you know, I see the, I see the responses that we get from those that are participating uh, in, in this program, in the IHUB program, but um, I wonder how we measure it. How do we know when it's time to uh, let some go and bring some new ones in? Um, I appreciate it when they tell us they're doing better or they have more listeners or they, um, you know, they're, they're excited about a, a potential um, project coming up. But how are we um, making sure that the people that are there are really using this in the way that we had intended or the former council that <clears throat> created it intended it? And are we, and you know, are there people waiting in line to, to become involved with this <clears throat> program and what are we doing with them? Um, there just isn't much <clears throat> history. And, I, and Dr. Reddy, I'm, I apologize for actually bringing this up this way. I should have given you a heads up on this. I don't expect you to really respond, but in the future, I'd like to see um, a little bit more information on the hows and whys of this, the nuts and bolts of how it's working, and um, who's waiting in line, if anybody, how long those who are there have been there, and are we measuring their success ourselves beyond just what they're telling us? There's a, there's a long answer to that, but I think maybe what's more appropriate right now is, is a, a, a more summary answer, and I think you, you raise valid questions, and uh, it, what might be best is, because uh, we struggled with this on this item tonight, uh, the alternative is to bring in the director of the IHUB that we contract with and have <clears throat> actually give the report and walk through and be able to answer some of these questions with some more substance. So why don't we do that? We, will, we can pull this uh, from the agenda this evening. We'll bring it back, but actually as a discussion item, <clears throat> and he can uh, actually go through it, and we can address those questions. Thanks so okay. much. Sure. Just, just as a comment, I'd like to add that uh, a few, uh, some of us were recently we had the Coachella Economic Partnership, which I have is part of uh, their report, their breakfast report, and there was a really good report made that morning, and we had a lot of speakers and a lot of people talk from throughout the valley, not just Palm Springs, because this is a this is a Coachella Valley effort. But we have an iHub, and, and Palm Desert is now starting an iHub, and uh, Joe Wallace has really taken this tremendously far in the last, when I, I, when I first toured this three years ago, there was me, mostly empty rooms and shells and there wasn't much over there. I would suggest that any member of council or actually anyone in the community who's interested in the IHUB and like to see what's happening, call Joe Wallace and he is, he loves to give tours. And he would be happy to give you a tour and let you meet the people who are actually building their, their businesses there. And there's a lot of great sustainability businesses there, uh, energy related and uh, electric vehicles related, et cetera. So call up Joe, Joe Wallace and, and get a, uh, a tour. I think you'll really enjoy it. You know, Mayor, I think that's, uh, that's an excellent idea. And maybe uh, I'd, I'd even go one further. Perhaps we should go as a group and invite the public to go with us. And perhaps we'd get some media coverage on that and remind people about this program. Most citizens have no idea that this is going on or even what we're talking about right now. So maybe it's time for, for a, a council tour um, and invite the public to go with us and let the people within this program show us in the community what they're doing um, and uh, show the whole valley uh, if we can get some press to go with us. Technically, we could do that. We just have to notice it, and then the public would have to be able to come. Sure. Or, or unless uh, there, there was a subcommittee on the IHUB uh, for, for these kinds of things. I mean, it would be obviously, just it would be easier if a subcommittee did it. It wouldn't be, a, in essence, a notice public meeting, but you certainly could uh, do it as a, a subcommittee and, and invite the public. 
Um, but we could do it the other way. You, I, you I was could. actually suggesting that we do it, that we notice it, that we invite the public, that we all go and, and actually experience it, experience it together. Councilmember Holstage? We might want to talk to Joe Wallace because I've also sat down with him and toured the facility, but we might want to talk to him about um, just holding it open. So instead of a noticed meeting, um, he could they could probably do an open house or something like that because I know I have would work at the courthouse and walk by it, and I think a lot of of the community doesn't know it's just across the street from here, right? So I think maybe an open house or something like that, since um, it's a program funded in part by the city of Palm Springs and our residents um, would be able to learn about it that way. I think it would be really good because for entrepreneurs and people who want to start companies up here in Palm Springs, that's an important resource as well. So I think that's a great idea. And also Joe Wallace can tell you what their long, longer term plans are. And a lot of those have to do with the uh, College of the Desert expansion here in Palm Springs because uh, some of the curricula uh, that they will be teaching at the new college really ties into a lot of the work they're doing there, such as in healthcare and also sustainable energy. Uh, those are two areas that we have a lot of, we have several businesses at the IHUB right now. And also when the, uh, when the College of the Desert is here, they'll be bringing in, I forget what it's called, there's a high speed gig, multi gigabit uh, connection for the internet that'll be available to go from the College of the Desert to the IHUB. So that will also make it better for I businesses there who are, who are doing development. So there's a lot of things that are happening now and are planned to go forward, such as when the College of the Desert is built. So it would be good to have an, an open house. Uh, Dr. Reddy, can we just work on something like that? So you want to table this, or you just want to? We have a subcommittee, right? Still? Uh, you know, I'm not certain if that still exists. We, did, may, did have, we, kill we may have trimmed that down in the last uh -huh. pairing. Because uh, what used to be you and I, and I don't know who it is today. We have a subcommittee for everything. <laughs> it's uh, the mayor. Okay. Oh, is it? Okay. Well, we'll set up something. We'll do it when we're working on the ad hoc committee list. Okay. So we're going to table this. Yeah, we're just receiving and filing. Okay. Do we have a motion to receive and file? Motion made by Councilmember Corey, seconded by Councilmember Holstage. Motion is on the floor. Motion passes five to zero. Next item is motion is item one F. Uh, purchase of news racks for the downtown, uptown business district areas. Council Mayor Pro Tem Roberts. <clears throat> Thank you, Mayor. I'll be brief on this. So um, about a uh, year ago, um, council, uh, uh, council approved that I be liaison for the city for, to start looking at downtown furniture um, options. And um, along with our facility staff, we pulled some, we've created some samples of benches and we've been researching it <clears throat> and trying different things because Palm Springs, un unlike other cities, can be much harder on its furniture. Uh, not only because of the nature of our downtown and how much use it gets, but because of the incredible um, environmental elements um, that our furniture takes. And um, what we've since done after trying some benches and getting a lot of different input, we've handed that over to the Main Street group uh, to come up with some ideas for us. And I know they say, they tell me that they're gonna bring us some ideas in the very new f near future. We, we had uh, decided and found a trash can that we felt was very effective. It was affordable, it was, affordable. It was much more effective for uh, recycling. Uh, it was much more effective for our facilities. They could deal with them, clean them, empty them, and maintain them for in a fraction of the amount of time. So overall, the savings that we'll see in those cans is huge. Um, and Stacy is here and can tell us more about it if we like. With respect to the downtown racks, we looked at a number of racks and we decided to sample the one that we have right now. And uh, the city actually, there, I know there's been a lot of conversation about this um, online and a, and a lot of input as we would expect. Um, but at the end of the day, w this was the best thing that we could find for this purpose without having clustered boxes. We were looking for a way to get rid of the busyness and the messiness of the clustered boxes. Put it all in one place, keep it clean, and continue to have 
periodicals. And to answer many online, yes, people still read periodicals. And they want periodicals. And they want newspapers. Uh, the, the World Wide Web did not kill that. And we actually have sort of a requirement to provide places for, for those periodicals. And we want to do that. And so um, that's why you're seeing this. Um, we, we Facilities searched hard. We looked at many options. And we didn't find any that would be as strong or as efficient or hold up as well in the long run as this one unit that we have. I don't know that we have to have it double height. I'll let uh, Stacy Schaefer respond to that if she wants to. Um, I know that there was some concern about the height of it. Um, and I know we can get it in different configurations. Uh, Stacy, do you wanna do you wanna speak to that? I know it was really about having enough space in them, right? Without them getting too long. Can she have a mic? Okay. Um, we can get them in four or six or seven. Um, the ones we chose were going to minimize the amount of uh, racks on the sidewalks, basically, as we discussed. This will actually can consolidate the 47 individual racks to eight. That's why we went with the height that we did. And with a much smaller footprint exactly. than, what we were, than what we had with the big run of racks on the ground. And correct? consistency, yeah. And you're not having the vandalism problems with this that you were having with all the racks, right? Correct. So you still feel that this was our best choice? Yes, and we can definitely look at uh, uh, the shorter options, but that means now we're, we're going to be adding more and more as we go. If we, we went shorter, they have four racks, they're four slotted units. But again, now we're going to be probably up to 10, 12. How many periodicals have we committed to housing in these clusters? Currently, we're permitted for 47. 47 periodicals have to be housed. Okay, and, and we're doing that effectively with the unit that we're looking at, correct? The, the unit that we have, yes. We, what the ones that, uh, the few that were removed, we, we obviously made sure that they had access to that and, and those uh, vendors are still utilizing ours. Thank you. I'm sure other people have questions, but I just want to give a little background on it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I, I tried to follow as best I could the uh, commentary on the social media on this. One of the questions that came up was whether or not uh, our ordinances required that these racks be painted white. Uh, and so the, my question is, actually, can we uh, buy these, or do we have to change our ordinance in order to be able to do yes. this? I, I would note that the, the current ordinance we have, uh, that was for a different model where, where we required those who wanted them to get permits and to purchase them, procure them, and put them on our right-of-way. This is a different model where we are going to provide that, provide it for them. So yes, yeah, so if council approves this, we will be bringing back a change in the ordinance which changes the model. So in essence, we're providing these for the, the news organizations now instead of us requiring them to. And the benefit of this is then we can make it uh, uniform on both the footprint and, and what the, the equipment is. Uh, the, the ordinance is sort of old in the sense of the requirements, the height and the width and the, the color and things of that nature. So that will all be removed from the ordinance. Thank you. Yes. I'm just going to say I, I think this is a much cleaner look uh, as a uh, uh, out old person. Uh, I still read uh, on paper uh, frequently. Uh, and as an out old person, my knees don't want to get down to the uh, to low, so I'm glad that there's a little bit of height uh, <coughs> before we we go to them. So thank you, Councilman Coors. Did you, Councilman Coors? Uh, thank you, Mayor. Just a couple questions for staff. So my understanding is we have require sort of free speech requirements to provide some space. So what exact does, what are the requirements? Are there a certain number we have to provide? I didn't get that information, so I was sort of curious. Well, and I, I, the attorney can address them more specifically, but our requirement is to provide it, provide it somewhere and right. in certain areas. Right. It's just how, how much do we have to... So my question, I'll give you both. How much do we have to provide, and how do we decide which media gets the placements? Well, well in terms of which media gets it, it's open to everyone. 
And most of these are the free, just the couple that want to have the, you know, you have to pay for it, then they, they are required to buy that equipment and then we install it. And so then they would have the pay. But the rest of them are free and it's open to any publication. So is it first come, first serve? I mean, how do we, let's say you have, you know, 10 publications who want to each have five spaces and we don't have that many, for example. Let's, in other words, how, how would we decide or we've never had... Yeah. Um, all of them filled and hasn't well, we've, been a we've never had uh, more than requests than what we we okay. do uh, But if that did come up we could choose to to get more if we were required to well, and that's, that's the question What are we required to do? I think it would be helpful to know You're not going to turn anyone away on content for obvious reasons Clearly. as you've stated and in terms of Volume the the city has the capacity to do what it's doing now if the five of you say that it does. If there are additional requests for that space, uh, staff can bring that forward to you and the council can consider the possibility of augmenting the availability of the racks. So this would suffice to cover yeah, our Yeah, there's nothing illegal about doing this right now right. Okay. apart from the ordinance change that Dr. Reddy alluded to. Okay, thank you. And uh, I do appreciate the work of the mayor pro tem to Look at all these, and um, Stacy as well. I know uh, a lot goes into into that work um, in our liaison subcommittee, many roles. Councilmember Middleton raised. Um, so thank you for that. My only other question, which I raised last time, regarding a purchase, um, especially when we're buying from um, a company based in Indiana that um, still allows legal discrimination against LGBT people. Um, what are we doing to make sure? these purchase orders are in compliance with our non-discrimination equal benefits ordinance. Well, you, you gave that direction. Yeah. I'll be speaking with Mr. Gladders about it. Okay. Can we get, one, make sure it's a part of this. Absolutely. And two, if we can just get the process, I'm sure he has one, but if you can report back to us at the next meeting what that is. Yeah, perhaps. And maybe note in the reports that that's been done or something. Perhaps a receive and file to the extent that here's the form that we're using. Yes, something like that. That would be appreciated. Thank you. <clears throat> Councilmember Holstage. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. This is such an example of nothing in Palm Springs is always easy when it seems like it'll be easy. These are news racks, but there was a lot of public comment about this um, on social media, especially. So I learned through this that, so it's true that the city is required to provide news racks, um, just full stop, or is it that if we provide news racks, we have to do it for everyone, or we're legally required to do that? Right, we do it for everyone. In the past, the model was you would come in, get a permit, and then you would purchase your rack, and we would supply the space. Or the other option we have is we can supply the news rack and just make it open for everyone. So we're constitutionally required to provide public space for these types of periodicals? No, it's as Dr. Reddy said, it's when we have the requests that we try to meet them under our existing news rack ordinance. There's been an inconsistency discussed. We'll be addressing that based on the antiquity of the ordinance we have. And again, we can augment the space available if we have a need to do so. But it's not constitutionally required that we have news racks per se. So that was my question. So I think the mayor pro tem did an excellent job. I think I always say he's in charge of all things pretty. He does a really good <laughs> job of that. You're the designer on council. You're much better than me at it. Um, you know, I don't love the idea of, of spending this amount of money on, on news racks. Um, I just think that I read periodicals. I read a lot of these. Um, it, it is... You know, um, I, I was swayed by some of those arguments that, um, you know, if we want to, we can. So I'm trying, that's what I was trying to figure out is if we have to um, or if we're just choosing to, because I do think they clutter the sidewalk. I think they take up a huge space. These are like mammoth type of structures um, in our walkways. We've talked a lot about <laughs> ADA access and um, making sure, you know, people with wheelchairs can get around and things like that. So well, well, I was just wondering that legal question. Well, I'll make it one comment and then Eddie needs to fill in the blank, but historically, uh, we've been instructed that we had some obligation to either provide them or provide space for them. We couldn't withhold it. Uh, so I, I don't know what specific law that the former attorneys were relying on, but I'll let Eddie. Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll be happy that. to research for you and report back as to any constitutional requirement that I'm not familiar with. 
I am not aware that you have to constitutionally provide news racks, and I, I will definitely report back to you on that. Uh, in fact, I can, uh, I can do so probably tomorrow. <laughs> Thank you. I don't think I have, I, I have any other questions. I mean, it's impressive that we're consolidating 47 down to eight, so that's a lot less clutter. I think it looks a lot less cluttered in the model that you chose. Um, you know, it's a lesson for us in legislating that the old law says and it has to be six and it has to be white, which is just really strange in and of itself. Um, you know, I'd like to probably see them smaller. Um, but it seems like we would have more. So I'll defer to the mayor pro tem who did a lot of work on this. This is going on a lot longer yeah. than I had hoped. Um, this rack was picked simply to do that job. We can't find, we can't make their periodical smaller. So each periodical requires a certain amount of space. So these, uh, this one that we found, this kind of what I call sort of chicken coop plan is, is the best way to consolidate because it, you only have the outside walls rather than walls in between them all to take up space and gaps. And, and so this is the best solution that we could find, but strong enough to withstand the abuse that these get. And these get, these get abuse from dogs, people, children, everything. And so um, we, we found this to be the best and strongest solution. So, I don't ever expect anything that we do on the street to not get, I think if you ask anyone's opinion on the street about something in Bomb Springs, any single mm -hmm. person, you'll get two opinions. And I expected that. So um, yeah, unless um, anybody has a better idea, I think we have found the best possible solution. And you know, I always, I, you know, I always really look to Stacy, who I think does an amazing job in running our downtown. Um, and the facilities of our downtown to tell us what she really needs and tell us what her staff can work with. And again, these require a lot less maintenance. And every time we do that, we become a little smarter and a little more efficient. So I always let her tell us what the program is. And then as you say, I be the guy who will think of what's pretty. Christy, um, I, this, this is a new one for me, thank you. So anyway, Stacy, thank you again. Any more discussion? But for clarification, did you want us to hold on this till we find out, can affirm one way or the other whether we're required to ha even provide these? I just want to say that whether we're required to or not, um, period periodical. My understanding is that we were required we were required to provide space, and it makes perfect sense to me because how else are people going to get periodicals unless? Um, they seek them out, and I think people enjoy them. And it also, to me, makes a tremendous amount of sense because many of them are promoting um, our downtown. There are maps in many of them. I think that they give our tourism a place to go to look things up and, and find out what's going on in town. So if anything, um, I would very much support keeping periodicals in our downtown and very accessible to those who come to visit us. Councilman Bacourt, did you have another request? Done, but just to an I will um, answer uh, the city manager's question. Um, I think we can move forward with this. I agree we should have periodicals uh, for folks. Um, we have to change the ordinance. So it would be good to know what we, what we have to do, um, what happens if more people want it than not, how we pick. It would be good to have that information from a legal point of view, but that, I don't think we need to not move this forward because of that. And I can provide that information. I, I'm not aware of that, but... Thank you. Okay, we have a motion to, I think we beat that to death. We have a motion by Councilor Middleton, seconded by Mayor Pro Tem Roberts. The motion is on the floor. Motion passes five to zero. Next item, item 1H, receive and file. Report regarding Friends of the Court brief filed in the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals in support of the State of California and United States versus California, a federal government challenge against recent state laws related to immigration policy. Mayor, uh, Council Member uh, Coors. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Uh, and I appreciate we had public comment on this. I just want to highlight because often when we vote to join um, briefs and we're one of 30 local jurisdictions to have done this, um, we can't release the brief yet until it's time to file and the public doesn't see it. Um, so this is our uh, friend of the court brief. 
In the case of the United States versus California, which California won in the district court, it is now appealed to the Ninth Circuit in support of SB 54, which is California sanctuary law. Mm -hmm. um, and the main points are that local governments in the state shouldn't be required to use their re limited resources to um, enforce immigration laws that are of the federal government. And also there's data, which is all in the brief, that shows that these laws, which Palm Springs had before the state passed theirs, um, result in people coming forward as witnesses in crimes and reporting crimes to the police and builds trust between our law enforcement and the community. So I just want to highlight that. The brief is here for everyone to read. And that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you. Do we, anyone else? We have a motion to approve, made by Councilmember Kors, seconded by Councilmember Holstead. Your motion is on the floor. Motion passes five to zero. Thank you. Next is public hearings. We have one public hearing, item 2A, an interim urgency ordinance of the City of Palm Springs, California to extend a temporary moratorium on conversions of golf courses to other uses for an additional four months to allow for consideration of appropriate amendments to the general plan or municipal code in accordance with the government code section 65858. Uh, staff report, please. Mr. Mayor and members of council, on October 17th, you passed a moratorium on the conversion of golf courses to other uses. Under state law, that interim urgency ordinance was valid for a period of 45 days. What we are requesting this evening is to extend the moratorium for an additional four months. Under state law, we could extend it as long as 10 months. However, we feel that we're at a point in the process where four months should be adequate for us to finish the work that we've been doing on a golf course conversion ordinance. As required under state law, we filed a report with you on November the 14th. Our next steps are to uh, hold a joint City Council Planning Commission study session to discuss the potential golf course conversion ordinance, and then after that, take direction from Council in terms of how you would like to proceed with that. So again, we are requesting to extend the moratorium for four months, and we would seek your approval of that. Uh, you will see that you just received additional correspondence on this matter in support of the moratorium, uh, and I believe there's additional materials in your yellow folders as well. That concludes my staff report. Happy to answer any questions you might have. Do we have any questions, we... Sorry, have any questions of staff before we open this to public hearing? Uh, first, Councilmember Coors. Oh, Councilmember Middleton. Uh, Director, do we have a date yet uh, for that joint uh, meeting with the Planning Commission and the uh, City Council? At our last City Council meeting, we had discussed the date of December the 10th. I believe that we may look at moving that, but again, I'll take direction from Council on that. And I, I think you had a conflict. On... I, I, I do, but we do have backup. <laughs> We, I know we would like very much for you to be present. I also, though, would like to get this scheduled, and I know December is a struggle, but I think this is an incredibly important issue, and we are going to be losing uh, uh, expertise from the Planning Commission with two commissioners of uh, very long standing. So uh, let's do absolutely everything we can to get this scheduled uh, in December. Certainly. Any other questions of staff before we open the public hearing? Okay, seeing none, uh, the members of the public are invited to speak on this public hearing item for up to two minutes. We have two speakers so far, Russ Uthe and Ellen Strensky. Anyone else wishes to speak, please put a card into the city clerk. That way we'll open the public hearings. Mr. Uthe. Uh, for the record, my name is Russ Uthi. I've lived here for about 15 years, <clears throat> and I'm presently representing uh, a neighborhood up there, uh, Sonora Sunrise, which represents about 800 and some people, the largest in the city. We embellished Mystique Country Club, so we're most effective by that. <clears throat> I'm pleased to be part of this whole group because I've been working with them since January, and Kathy has been a great chairman, and I see, hate to see her leave, 
but that's the end of her term. It looks the way the city council is sitting that you'll be very impressed with voting for an extension. It's important to coordinate all our various rules and regulations into one consistent pattern. So I'll make it very short because I'm in pain with my left and my right hip. So thank you very much. <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Ruthie. Our next speaker is Ellen Strinsky. Hello. Um, um, uh, my name is Ellen Strensky, and I'm a retired UC professor. I taught in English departments at UCLA and at UC Irvine for a number of years, 26, and I live here in Palm Springs. And uh, I wrote a college textbook that went into several editions, and it's one of the reasons I was able to afford a second home in Palm Springs. But um, anyway, on how to write research, and I taught research um, to undergraduates and graduate students. And I'm here to support the extension of the moratorium because I think it's, um, the issues are so complicated, they're contradictory often, the values, the beliefs that are operating in the discussion, and it's very difficult to weigh them, let alone quantify them. And so I just urge you to take all the time you need uh, to um, um, include all the uh, complicated analysis that's required. So uh, that's all. Thank you, Ms. Trinsky. We have another speaker, Ruth Sinfuego. I'm in favor of the extension for the moratorium. Uh, obviously, we need the open space. You need the time to evaluate it. And our population grows, and we need more and more of it. And we're getting less and less. Thank you. Ms. Thank you, Ms. Sinfuego. Any, any other speakers, uh, City Clerk? Seeing none, we will close the public hearing speakers on this item. Uh, do we have any comments by council? Any comments? Okay, uh, uh, Director Fag, I noticed that in here on page, uh, on the second page, it says that uh, it can then be extended for one additional year by adoption of another interim emergency ordinance, blah, blah, blah. But we are going to work really, really hard to get this done in four months, right? Exactly, yes. Okay. Director, is that um, realistic? I mean, I don't want to continue doing the, the short ones. If you just need more time, we can do it. The Planning Commission has already reviewed the draft ordinance and recommended approval of it to you. And so the next process would be taking it through the City Council process, which involves the study session and then the first and second readings of the ordinance. Uh, again, I believe that we can accomplish that in four months. Thanks so much. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? If not, the motion to approve has been made by Councilmember Kors, seconded by Councilmember Middleton. This, uh, council, the motion is on the floor. Motion passes, five to zero. Next item is item 3A, which is legislative, proposed ordinance to allow any airport commission member to serve as chairperson. Staff reports, please. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor, members of council. Uh, as you know, currently the code requires that the chairman of the airport commission uh, is one of the Palm Springs uh, members. Uh, Palm Springs has, has 10 members on, and Down Valley Cities uh, have nine. Um, the City Council uh, made, made that so that the Palm Springs uh, contingent is always in the majority. Uh, I would note that uh, they had uh, passed resolution and recommend that Council uh, change that, in essence, to allow the chairman be any one of the board, not just one of the Palm Springs members. I would note that the... Uh, the, the actions and work of the airport commission is advisory in nature to the city council um, and the measures before you for your consideration. Thank you, Councilmember Coors. Uh, thank you, Mayor. And I wanna uh, thank both the speakers um, who I think helped me change my mind on this uh, tonight. I wasn't sure where I was going, but I thought what difference does it make? But I, I do think it makes a difference. I think I've seen other commissioners, um, the presidents and chairs of those commissions Sometimes they're here to answer questions. Sometimes they're interviewed by the press. And I think it's important that that be a representative of Palm Springs because we are ultimately the responsible party for the airport. And the majority of the Palm Springs members voted this way. And so my leaning is that we keep the current system. Um, I'm obviously open to being persuaded by my council members as they feel differently, but I think I was very much persuaded by our two speakers tonight. 
Thank you. Mayor Pro Tem Roberts. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, I concur with what Councilman Kaur said. I, I didn't really ha understand the implications of it, and so the speakers opened my eyes uh, to it. And for so, uh, along with just simply concurring with what my colleague said, I would say for two simple reasons: that if we are providing most of the funding, and uh, for the things that happen at the airport, I do believe that we should probably have a stronger say in the votes on those changes. And most definitely, the, if more than anything else, we should be having an, a say on the impacts of air travel on our community from our airport, um, more so than others. And because our community is certainly impacted in a much greater way. So um, I, I too have uh, changed my mind on this and will vote to oppose this. Okay, I, I'd like to add that uh, when I was reading this and uh, I, I kept thinking, you know, that uh, the city of Palm Springs pays for staff. I think we have 30 staff at the airport, something like 30, don't we? We have quite a bit of staff at the airport. Plus, we, the city of Palm Springs, our taxpayers pay for all the police security there. Plus, uh, we pay for all the maintenance and the, our, and the landscaping, and it's the Palm Springs airport. And also, I didn't think about it until tonight, it's our residents who live next door to the airport. And uh, people in the other cities, we have nine representatives from other cities on this who uh, all have a say in, in what goes on with the marketing. Uh, they have several subcommittees. So I think that's great. But since it is the Palm Springs Airport, our, our, our residents pay for the maintenance and the upkeep and live next door. I really uh, want to allow us to continue what's been the status quo for 15 years or so. Okay, Councilmember Middleton. Uh, Dr. Reddy, the chair of the uh, airport commission, what authority does that chair have uh, that's different from uh, the authority of any other member of the commission? Uh, none in vote, but they, they sort of the, par the, the parliamentarian of the meeting, they run the meeting, uh, but it's, it's a vote, one vote. Do we have any sense of what the motivation was on the part of the airport commission in bringing this proposal? Uh, to us, uh, it's my understanding that one of the the members, and it might have been the, and, and again I may be wrong, but I believe it was one of the members that was appointed from the county had just raised that question, uh, mm -hmm. and, the, and the board discussed it, uh, and and they they rec voted to recommend to at least send it to you for for discussion and consideration. Okay, um, I I was torn, and I'm still torn, but I can count votes. Uh, the, uh, the, let me ask another question though. Uh, as I understand it, the airport, uh, is an enterprise fund. Right. And are there any costs that come from the general fund, uh, that go to the support of the airport? Uh, the enterprise fund, uh, is self-containing, uh, but, but what is true is it cannot go the other way around. Unfortunately, <laughs> we can't not use any of those proceeds uh, in, in the general fund. Okay, so to the question of police officers, landscaping, uh, anything else that uh, is operating at the airport, is that coming out of our general fund or is that coming out of the enterprise fund? Uh, that's the enterprise fund, um, but, but I think what uh, the, the one issue is is the administration pieces of it come from the city. And so, you know, there's there's some fungible kinds of uh, commingling of administration uh, that, that does come from the general fund. Uh, it's my understanding that by tradition, but not by uh, mandate, the chair has traditionally, has always been uh, someone from Palm Springs and the vice chair is someone from outside of Palm Springs. Is, is that correct or do you know? Uh, I, I, you, you know, I don't want to misspeak on that, mm -hmm. uh, but the, the vice chair may be a, at times, Palm Springs member. Uh, we, we work closely with our colleagues in, in other cities and I, I'm probably persuaded to, uh, to vote, uh, no on this, uh, but uh, I think it's incredibly important for us to uh, work cooperatively with uh, our colleagues in, in other cities. <clears throat> Councilmember Holstage. Quiz um, our staff, if, it's, if you don't know off, offhand, but I was wondering what the vote was at the airport commission. And so, um, 
in the future it'd be uh, helpful we, for me? Does it say that in the, we, we I don't do, think it have, says in the staff report. What was the vote? I found out today that it was 15 present, five voted no. So, so out of 15. 10 voted yes. Five. So it's 10 to five. Okay, that would be helpful in the staff report yeah. just because sometimes it is a close vote and we can't tell. Um, and then I'm concerned about the unfilled vacancies because it seems like that's a big part of the ordinance and the and making sure that there's a majority Palm Springs residents on there. So can we do something about that and filling those vacancies quickly? I know we're moving those forward. So I think that would be good to um, address some of the concerns that our commissioners here raised tonight. Um, I also see both sides of this because I think it's really important to um, be work collaboratively with um, our colleagues and neighboring jurisdictions, and I think that's really important. Um, but I was also really swayed by our constituents and our commissioners and the people who serve our cities in, in raising um, those concerns for Palm Springs. So you've also changed my mind tonight, um, and I'm going to uh, support uh, the majority vote of the Palm Springs um, commissioners. So thank you for being here. It really makes a difference when we can hear from you. Thank you for your service to our city. Okay, any other, any, I don't see any other ones. So do we, I'll call for the vote. Mayor Pro Tem, motion is made by Mayor Pro Tem Roberts, seconded by Council Member Holstage. Motion, oh, I'm sorry. You, your microphone's off. Well, the motion I'm making is to is to deny the request. Well, it says the, what we're voting on is the ordinance to allow the airport commission any airport any airport commission member to serve. So if we vote no, My we're saying is no. A, a denial to re, is is to deny that request, meaning it would stay as it is today. So we vote no. Vote no is what I'm proposing. Okay. <laughs> Do you want to clarify that? So it's to not introduce the ordinance. Correct. So you well, it's would not vote yes. It's just yes. a you would yeah. vote yes to not introduce the ordinance. I am no 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 no. No, it's no. the opposite. It's a proposed motion to allow. This is like Prop Eight. So yeah. yes. So okay. So if you're voting, then you're voting no. I'm no voting to no to introduce the ordinance to allow. It. So it is. A, it would be a yes. no vote. This is a request yes. for a change, and we're saying no to it, or I'm suggesting no to it. Mm -hmm. Okay. okay. Okay, motion's on the floor. <laughs> motion failed five to zero. <laughs> or, okay, thank the you. Ordinance is not introduced. Thank you, City Clerk. Next item. Under unfinished business item 4A, approval of a final release of the performance trust deed related to the downtown Palm Springs project. Staff report, please. Staff report, please. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, members of the council. The, uh, the item before you uh, returns after having been considered previously <coughs> and returned by request of the council. Uh, at this juncture, Staff recommends that the council approve this ministerial matter. Uh, this does relate to the original finance agreement for the downtown project. And the city is, if it approves the recommended action, releasing the deed of trust that secured the performance of the public and private improvements for the downtown project. Uh, I think that supplements the written staff report, and I'm available for questions, as is Mr. Fuller. Thank you, Mr. Cochran. Any questions of staff? Mayor Pro Tem Roberts. Um, <coughs> I just, Mayor, I'd like to make a clarification on this um, particular um, request. Um, that this hasn't, because I know there were some questions in the community about this. This has nothing to do with our rights under 1090. This is something completely separate from that. And I want to make that clear that we're not giving up any of those rights whatsoever in taking this action. You're correct. Okay, motion to approve. Motion to approve is made by Councilmember Holstage, seconded by Mayor Pro Tem Roberts. Motion is on the floor.
Motion passes five to zero. Thank you. Our next item is under item 5A, update regarding recruitment efforts for the city's boards and commission. Staff report, please. Honorable Mayor and City Council, <clears throat> um, the, the City Council has decide, decided back in, I believe, uh, May to extend the terms of all existing commissioners for an additional six months while the city was undergoing its um, uh, outreach regarding districting. And then at the same time, uh, it was believed that we could synergize our recruitment efforts for boards and commissions. Um, during that time, the city has uh, sent out a mailer to every uh, residence within the city, as well as we scheduled uh, 13 community engagement forums. Um, and we also provided um, English and Spanish radio ads, bus shelter advertisements, uh, website improvements, social media, online and print media advertisements. And in addition, <coughs> we hired a diversity consultant, Tizak Dazalan, and he uh, assisted in canvassing minority owned and frequented businesses, as well as uh, served as a liaison to uh, many of the uh, leaders in the minority communities. And in addition, he uh, assisted in a lot of the social media efforts. Um, it's hard to quantify whether or not this resulted in an increase in diversity because we don't uh, measure any demographics related to the applicants at this time. Uh, that is a recommendation of the CBR working group is to begin uh, monitoring that, uh, but we will need council direction on that. Uh, the, the method of measuring the success of the increased uh, efforts to recruit is that in 2017, during the uh, appointment and interviewing process, there were 47 applications on file. And in this year, we have 86 applications on file uh, with more coming in uh, each day. Um, I provided a summary of the uh, applications we have for each of the boards and commissions. Um, and I'm available if you have specific questions. Any questions of uh, Councilman McCors? Uh, thank you, Mayor. And I do think we've never had numbers, at least in my tenure, seeing that many people apply for boards and commissions. So I really want to thank the city clerk, um, the working group. Uh, you know, we also did you know, t the two mailers and bus shelters where we're encouraging people um, on the website and through other means. Um, and we'll see uh, how those interviews go because we now have a lot of time in interviews. Um, but there are also a bunch of recommendations that we received regarding how we can increase diversity. Um, Council Member Middleton and I, through a different um, subcommittee, which is government reform, ethics, transparency, government reform, had a working group who made some additional recommendations. So if anyone doesn't like any of the ones that are here, um, share it with us. We can then bring back all the ones we received for council to then vote if we want to adopt um, at a future meeting. Uh, I think a lot of these, you know, are really good. Some of them overlap with the recommendations that we received previously. Um, I don't think we need, it's obviously been public, we don't need to go over all of them, but if anyone has concerns about some of them and there's consensus they don't want to move forward, don't want us to work on it, we won't. Other than that, we'll bring something back and we can actually debate it when we have a full bunch of recommendations. You know, in, I presume in an ordinance is how we would do it, or a policy. Uh, having, there's a lot of good recommendations in here. I know the CVRA's uh, uh, working group has done a lot of good work, but I was looking at these, I was thinking uh, it would be good, not an ad hoc committee, but I was thinking if we could ask the city uh, clerk to put to ask for some volunteers from chairman of our different boards and commissions to put together their own working group of five, seven, nine or so, however chair, many chairmen or, sub, or, or other members of our boards and commissions would like to get together and review these and come back to us with some recommendations because we now we have a perspective from the CVRA perspective, but I would, you know, people who actually are on the ground working and running and operating these boards and commissions, I would really like to have their input on this. I think most of us have served on boards and commissions ourselves, but I think a group of, uh, Anthony, you could put together a group, couldn't you, and uh, come back to us with a report? Okay, so I'd like to recommend we do that. Councilmember Holstage. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I agree. I think that's a great idea. I know in the past there was actually um, a small group of 
um, like a cabinet of all of the chairs that would advise the city council and the mayor, actually. Um, I think we really need to do more work integrating our chairs who are leaders and do a lot of this work for the council and the city um, and getting their input in a lot of the things that we do. So I think that's a great idea and I would, I would second that as well um, to bring them into these and they might have additional recommendations. So maybe the subcommittee could meet with a working group of all of the chairs, that would be fantastic. I put stars next to each of these recommendations. I like them all. I especially like um, the youth liaison idea. I served on the Human Rights Commission and it's the only commission currently that has um, youth commissioners, though they don't have a vote and they should. Um, we went to the Palm Springs Unified School District Board meeting last night um, and they have youth leaders and chairs and I just think that's a really important um, perspective. So I like all of these, so I would hope the working group and the subcommittee can take those back and bring them forward. My comment is again, the same as before, that we need to do that quickly because people who work or who have children need to know if they can serve on these subcommittee, on these commissions. And so I think we need to do that um, sooner rather than later. So if you can, I don't know what your timeline is for bringing some of that back to us, um, <clears throat> if you're able to do it sooner rather than later versus bringing it all in. My only question about our process, and it might not be something we need to answer right now, um, but it's a question about prior applicants. So I know I've been involved with a number of my colleagues of interviewing applicants, and I want to make sure that we're not losing them um, when we maybe don't pick them initially because we have so many, we're so privileged here to have so many amazing applicants who are highly, highly qualified. Um, I know my husband's applied for Measure J a few times and didn't get it, and you know lots of people apply. Um, and so it's important to keep those people in the pipeline um, that they continue to be able to serve and we don't lose them. So are we including prior applicants in each process as we move forward? Yeah, so I was um, surprised that past applicants uh, were not requested to return. Uh, however, my direction to staff has been um, we will contact every prior applicant and ask them if they're still interested in interviewing for the boards and commissions. I think that's a fantastic idea. So thank you for being one step ahead of us on that because I, I really don't want to discourage anyone. I know it's discouraging if you apply um, and you don't get on initially, but I know we had a lot of really amazing applicants and we want to keep them in the pipeline. So thank you. That's all I have, Mr. Mayor. And there's a couple of administrative things here, uh, uh, Mr. Mejia. Uh, under these recommendations, they're just administrative on these two waivers. Uh, we, we, can we go ahead and vote on those two waivers tonight to make sure to make that official? I think we should do those two waivers uh, because those are sort of archaic rules that we haven't gone by in the last three years that I know of. So, Councilmember Middleton? Well, fortunately, most everything I was going to say has been said, but uh, I do like the idea of uh, bringing together all of the chairs of the various commissions. I think we'll get an awful lot of insight uh, from that. And I look forward to working with the mayor to uh, uh, move our recommendations on streamlining the number of commissions and ad hoc, or ad hocs and committees as quickly as we possibly can. There, I think we'll have a little bit of time in December before uh, uh, we all try to get away for the holidays. And you know, actually, actually putting more of the uh, advisory roles instead of ad hocs, pushing them to the boards and commission is good for them too, because our boards and commissions are are, are areas for people, our residents, who to learn about city government. And a lot of our people who run for office come from those boards and commissions. So it's a good uh, undergraduate school for them. Okay, motion to approve is made by Councilmember Holstead, seconded by Councilmember Kors. Motion is on the floor. Oh, thought I pushed it. Okay. Motion passes five to zero. Next item is public comment on non-agenda items. This time has been set aside for members of the public to address the City Council on items of general interest within the subject matter of jurisdiction of the City. Although the City Council values your comments, pursuant to the Brown Act, it generally cannot take any action on items not listed on the posted agenda. Two minutes will be assigned to each speaker. Do we have anyone who wishes to speak in this portion? Mr. Mejia. None? Are you not seeing it? Do you see names? 
Anyone else who wishes to speak, please uh, see the city clerk and fill in a card and put your name and uh, subject on there. Do you not see names? Pardon? Are you not seeing the names? Now I am. Okay. No, they just popped up. Wait, wait, wait. I've got two names on here. They just came up. I'm sorry. The first speaker is Daryl Terrell and then Rick Pantelli. Anyone else who wishes to speak, please put a card in at this time. Sorry, we still are suffering sometimes from our system. I'm adding Mr. Terrell, come on up. Hi, my name is Daryl Terrell from Reno Valley. Harvey Milk once said... Hope will never be silent. I know that we are all struggling right now with what we've witnessed over the past several weeks as a nation and as a community. We have known hard times before. We have seen, what have seen us through, what has always seen us through is our strength, our resilience, and our courage, and our perseverance. That's when you remember that when times are tough, whenever times have seemed at their worst, we always have been at our best. That's when you are reminded that we have always been defined by our hopes, not by our fears. That same hope gave young people the courage to endure billy clubs, water hoses, tear gas, trampling hooves, to sit at a lunch counter and march across the Adam Pettus Bridge in Selma with full of faith and hope to Montgomery for freedom causes. That same hope led you guys and past city councils to stand up for sensible gun control, women's rights, immigrants, human rights, the environment, against hate, for affordable housing, that same hope is what built this community, the belief that there are better days ahead, despite our challenges, if we have the courage to persevere and keep fighting. That's the spirit that has always sustained this country and a community through times of great challenges. If we summon that, that great spirit once again, we will meet our challenges and write a new chapter in this great city, in this great country. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Terrell. Our next speaker is Rick Pantelli, followed by Les Young, and then David Zecca. Anyone else who wishes to speak, please put a card in to the city clerk at this time. Good evening. Hearing Daryl quote Harvey Milk is worth coming to the council meeting. Um, a few months ago, I saw on the news Palm Springs police officer Brian Perez, um, he had a tumor removed from his brain size of a small orange. And uh, I've been following it, <clears throat> and about a month or so ago, I decided to do something nice, and I've arranged for a trip for him and his wife, or his girlfriend, and uh, I should say, and their seven-year-old son, Seth, to go to Maui for 10 days, to Waialea. And all of their expenses have been paid for, except for just a little bit. Uh, uh, I had no problem with Mr. Master, who immediately came forward in the first 24 hours and paid for the airfare. Gary at Cardiff Limousine, Willie Rhine uh, stepped up. I've raised somewhere around $14,000, $15,000. He's all covered, but I still have a little bit of money on the GoFundMe page for him to have some pocket change, pay for gratuities. They're going to go on a sail to Molokini. They're going to go snorkeling. They're going to go on a helicopter ride. They're staying at the Fairmont Kialani. They're staying in the best. I do this for the, him, for his son, what they went through this past year, and for the wife. I also know that the medicine and the healing that the doctors give helps that, but the healing for the soul can only come from a place like Hawaii. Uh, Shakespeare pretty much put it in a wonderful way that I wanted to quote, that how far this little candle throws his beam, so shines a good deed in a weird world. I'm going to leave some cards up here. If any of the staff would like to contribute and help me finalize this vacation, make a wonderful trip for him. I just learned today he dodged another, or um, he carefully is not going to have to go to any more treatments for a while. But uh, that type of a treatment he has, you're never out of the woods in that kind of a thing. He's going to be dealing with it for a long, long time. And uh, I greatly thank you. Appreciate all your help. Thank you, Mr. Pantelli. And the next speaker is Les Young. 
followed by David Zecca. <clears throat> Mayor Moon, Mayor Pro Tem Roberts, and Council and staff, I'd like to invite you and the public to attend an event tomorrow. Uh, it's Stuff the Bearcat. It's being hosted by the Police Advisory Board and Palm Springs Police Department. <clears throat> We'll be at the Walmart on Ramon from 8 a.m. until 2 p.m., yes, even if it is raining. And um, the event is for the benefit of the clients of Mizell Meals on Wheels and Well in the Desert. Please remember, the winter holidays are also for adults, seniors, the underserved, and the homeless. So be as generous as you can in joining us. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Young. Next speaker is David Zecca. Mr. Zeka will be our last speaker unless someone else puts in a card. Hi, um, my name is David Zeka, and I fell in love with this city 12 years ago when I came here on vacation. And I knew immediately that I would live here one day. Um, and I did. Um, and I vote in every election. I voted for the, the two new council members that sit on this council. Um, and what I'm disturbed about is that I've emailed four of the five people, with the exception of you, uh, Mayor Pro Tem Roberts, and I only heard back from one, and that's you, Ms. Holstedge. And I want to tell you that your moral compass is second to none. You responded to that email in 24 hours, just like you stated tonight when I was listening in the audience. Um, and then I also heard that you only have one administrative assistance for all four of you all. Maybe you need to have Five. a motion to vote to, to, to hire another person to, to assist you, because that poor person workload has got to be immense. So I'm just disappointed because I wanted to share ideas of what I thought would be great for this city, what I was passionate about, and to hear nothing from three out of four of you, with the exception again of you, Ms. Holstage, is disappointing at best. So, so I hope in the future when I email you, or if you're not gonna answer to social media, which I reached out to you, Ms. Middleton, and got no response, it's disappointing. Don't offer that. I will again say that Ms. Holstage communication was second to none. I reached out to her via social media, and there was a, a, a message immediately that said, please contact me through my email at city council, which I did, and I received a prompt response from. So again, I'm very thankful for that, Ms. Holstage, and I'm, I'm, I'm very grateful that I voted for you. So I, I just want to bring that out to you. It's the only way your citizens have sometimes, especially in an elderly community, to reach out to you. Luckily, I'm still in good health and I can come here and I can sit through this meeting to address this issue that I'm obviously passionate about. So hopefully in the future, you'll respond to emails. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Zeka. Anyone else? Okay, uh, seeing none of those, we will close that portion of the Public comment, city council and city manager request an upcoming agenda development. Anyone? Councilmember Coors. Um, thank you, Mayor. Um, <clears throat> just a question, the council call up of cannabis continued from 1114, is that still on the fifth? I believe the city attorney has is, is indicated you wanted that go to the 19th now, continue to the 19th. That's correct. I, uh, I was in touch today with the owner of the property who's coming in to meet with the staff next week with respect to the issues that have been raised. Uh, we do have a lot of documentation, obviously, with respect to odor issues. And with council's approval, of course, we would prefer to have that matter considered December 19th. Uh, I do have in writing that that's acceptable to the, uh, to the owner of the property. Okay. Uh Thank you. Um, just looking at this, and I guess we don't have that much at that next meeting. Um, looks like we're going to have a lot on December 19th, so I just want to raise the number of things that have December on them. Just obviously you have to prioritize, but uh, just be conscious of that, because that's also, um, we also have the districting ordinance second reading that night as well. Um, second thing is, um, I appreciate, and I think we can wait a little while on our subcommittees and ad hocs, and I see we have uh, election mayor pro tem, but we probably should also at least do our assignments to the outside agencies so we can start planning, because if we're gonna change anything, and obviously we're changing one, because um, council member, member Middleton doesn't wanna stay on that, um, we can start blocking our calendars for January meetings. So it looks like we're gonna have more time then than the 19th. 
So it might be good to at least do the outside appointments and those things uh, next week if we can. You know, the CVAG ones, those kind of things. Unless anyone disagrees. That's it. Thank you. Oh. Um, also, just, and I think this can all be January, I think we should probably, and maybe do it as a discussion item, there are a number of, I think, different subcommittees work bringing up different economic incentive ideas. Um, you know, Mayor Pro Tem Roberts raised it with affordable housing. Um, there have been issues with cannabis. Uh, Council Member Holstage and I are working on one regarding hotel renovations and food deserts. So I think it might be good to have a discussion of them with the whole council and sort of get the appetite. We may have an ordinance um, on the hotels. Um, and uh, We're hoping to have more on food deserts by then, but I think it would be, might be worth a discussion item sometimes in January. So just the city manager can look into that and however you think the best way to handle it is uh, would be appreciated. Thank you. Thank you. I, I just have one question, Dr. Reddy, I'm sure you've got this covered, but I believe our, our uh, contract with the convention center management company ends in December. We have to extend that because we won't be have, we won't have vote selected a new one yet. So is that a, just a consent matter item? Uh, yes, uh, Mayor. Uh, thank you. Uh, that, that will be uh, at least on the 19th. It'll be an extension of the convention center. Contract, and and that's why we're going through the RFP. We're <clears throat> still going through the the uh, review process on the uh, request for proposals. Okay. And the mayor and I are on that ad hoc. And um, do you think we'll be potentially ready to do that on the nineteenth? Well, do you think it'll just be January? an extension on the nineteenth. Okay. My so mind, I anticipate it's a January time frame before a recommendation comes back to the council. Okay. Yeah, well, I just want to make sure we had a yeah. continuity, and we extend because we can do a month to month extension, but we just have to vote on to approve it, right? Correct. Yeah, that's a good point. Okay, so you're thinking January for the actual? Uh, yes, vote. late late January, early February. Okay, that works. Thank you. Okay, Mayor Pro Tem Roberts. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, Dr. Reddy, I, I need some memory help here. So I got a call from uh, Richard Weintraub uh, with respect to the um, Orchid Tree uh, entitlement extension, uh, questioning me about the, co the call up of that. And I guess. Um, when he was um, notified that that would be called up, he was told that I actually called it up. And I don't remember if it was me or the whole council or how that came about. Um, but I did have a, a long conversation with him sort of to get an update <clears throat> on where he is. And um, we're sort of in the same place we always were. You know, he, he is looking for um, solutions to additional parking and so forth, but we really haven't gone forward. And I guess I just needed the council's help of why we were pulling that back up specifically. I know um, we uh, wanted to see where he where he is with it, but we're we're kind of nowhere with it. <laughs> well, 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 I mean, it's sort of we're at an impasse, waiting for him to come up with some solutions to his own issues, and we're giving and this, the planning commission saw fit to to give him that extension, but. I was wondering again why we had. Well, well it's, it's sort of a, a, a placeholder for the moment. So in my conversations with him, obviously he wanted to keep that entitlement alive. So he went through the planning process to extend it. Uh, obviously it's pull up, he understands that. Uh, he may before the meeting uh, actually uh, ask the item to be removed because if in fact he's not gonna be able to go forward with no bearish, there'd be no reason to have that. Uh, he would just pull it and then resubmit for whatever new project he's gonna do. So I would anticipate hearing a final decision from him this week. So it's on placeholder, it's been noticed, we can go forward if he chooses. Um, if not, we'll just pull it from the agenda. Okay, thank you, that's helpful. I asked him the same question about a bearish and he wasn't really sure, but I reminded him that his extension was based on that being an auberge hotel. Um, and he understood that. So he seemed more positive than negative on that. So maybe he'll have good news for us. Thank you. <clears throat> Councilmember Holstage. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I just wanted to um, amend and add to um, my comment and my request earlier. Um, <clears throat> You know, I talked about adding staff for the council to be able to adequately respond to the public. I do think it's our job. Um, you can tell it's really, really difficult. We have 47,000 constituents, um, and we just have an inefficient system because what happens is um, people email all of us, and because of the Brown Act, we're not able to 
reply all or even know that our colleagues responded and we have different subcommittees and different experts on different things. So I'm wondering if with staff, staff recommendation about staffing, I talked about that, but also I know there's a lot of technology um, programs that actually put all the input that we get because we get a lot of input on social media. I mean, I've seen requests on LinkedIn that I didn't even know about that related to, that I just don't check. Um, so I'm wondering if in addition to looking at staffing, um, we can just look at um, using programs that put that all together. So all the input comes through that program. I've researched a number of them. Um, and then it, it allows us efficiently to respond to constituents so that you don't have each council member responding when we're able to, because out of 47,000 people who email us, um, you know, a lot can say that it's haphazard, it's difficult for all of us to respond, and I don't know if that's the most efficient use of if you want your council members spending 20 hours of our week um, replying to all emails all together, right? Just sending you the same response five times. Um, so if we could talk about that um, and just maybe research some of those technology solutions that other cities have used, because I think there's a lot more efficiencies and then we can, again, you know, get really good service, um, which you know, we have a duty to, resp to, to serve the public, so we're bound by that. So if we could just use some technology, I bet it would be pretty cheap um, to efficiently respond to all of those, you know, um, questions that we get electronically, especially. So thank you. I'd like to add to what Councilmember Holsage said, and the reality of it is that we get a lot of emails. And, it's, and also in this day and age, a lot of the emails we get are spam. And so we have to filter through all the spam, and I, I'm sure everyone's in the same boat I am. A lot of times you're looking at emails before you go to bed on your iPhone, or when you first get up in the morning and you go, oh, this is going to take some while for me to research. So what you do is you, you mark it as unread or you flag it so you can, once you get to the office or you have some time, you can research it and look it up. Sometimes I know I will flag something or I'll forget to flag it or I, I won't mark it as unread and I forget about it. So, you know, we are human. So I would suggest if someone emails us for something and they don't get an answer back, you know, within an, a day or two, email us again because we might have missed it the first time or it might have dropped through the crack or got lost in the spam. I know sometimes I'm going click, 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 getting rid of all the advertisements for people wanting us to buy everything you can imagine and uh, you can accidentally delete somebody. So give us a break. If, if we don't give, answer you like within you know 24 hours, email us again, say, hey, I didn't get an answer and give us a second chance. Councilmember Middleton. Okay, I'm just going to pick uh, up on that theme and keep it very short. Uh, I know all of us uh, invest an incredible amount of time trying to stay on top of all of the correspondence that we get. If there's some technological solutions that will help, uh, that'll be great. Uh, Christy will get it in, or excuse me, Councilmember Holstage will pick up that new technology in the first five minutes and then a few months later, Maybe I'll learn it. Uh, but uh, I really do encourage people, reach out to us through telephones and through emails. Uh, social media is, uh, is varied. It is uh, very extensive. And uh, no one uh, can keep up with all of the different uh, vehicles that are out there for social media. And frequently what's out there on social media is people want to make commentary and uh, to get in the middle of some of that commentary is uh, to put ourselves at risk for violations of the Brown Act. Uh, and uh, when we get an email, when we get a phone call, uh, we do our absolute level best to, uh, to get on top of it and respond to it. Uh, and it also, at least I'd also like to also add to that, that if people contact us through social media, it does, it's not very efficient because when they email us officially on our email, we can forward, we can, a lot of times, I'm sure you guys do what I do, you'll answer the person and say, I'm, re I'm referring your question to Dr. Reddy or to Marcus Fuller or to our city attorney. We can't really task other staff other than them. But uh, a lot of, if, if it comes in on social media, we can't do that. Uh, we can't forward it to staff and ask for a response. So please, if someone has something important, make sure it comes through. Uh, our, our official email accounts. That way there's a record of it and, uh, and uh, we can 
administratively handle it. Councilmember Holstage? Can I just comment really quickly, and it's not anything that we would consider, but just for since we're educating the public about contacting us, I actually have a bot, I have a form reply to everyone who comments, uh, who um, messages my page on social media. Because of the Brown Act, all of the work and business that we have to do for the city is public business, and it has to be um, available to the public. And so that's why you have to email us, and my reply says, please email me because when I'm not on council and the someone does a public records act request for all of my comments on robo lights if it's on my personal Facebook it actually could violate um, some of the ethical rules we have because it's not pub available to the public so when I'm not replying or every time you message me on on Facebook and I say please email me um, one I want all my communications for the city to be in one place and actually we have ethical rules that require us to, all of our communications to be available to the public because it's public business so yes you should expect that if you message on Facebook or Instagram or LinkedIn your council members that we actually can't do city business there and we're we have a lot of ethical rules that is the reason for that so thank you anyone else uh, mr. mayor uh, I, I do have one request and this is just a, a, a a question for the City Council. As you know, we have a joint City Council Planning Commission meeting scheduled for December the 10th at 6 p.m. Um, we've it's come to light is, is the 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 planning director has a conflict that that cannot be changed that day. Now now we're prepared and are able to move forward uh, with that meeting. Uh, the planning director has indicated that uh, you know his staff can can address the questions. But my my I throw the question out to you if you would want feel better rescheduling that meeting or if we want to go forward. Reschedule. Um, I would <clears throat> like to just ask uh, Director Fag that question. I'm. Fine to go forward unless he would prefer that we reschedule so he can be present. I'm. It's critical that we get this study session done. <laughs> As Council Member Middleton has indicated, we are losing two of our planning commissioners. And so, uh, again, it's critical that we hold the study session prior to the end of December. My preference would be to be there. Um, while I am confident that my staff and uh, Mr. Priest, our attorney who has done work on the ordinances, would be there to answer questions. My preference would be to be there. Uh, and so, other than December the 10th, <laughs> I am available in the month of December. We uh, perhaps explore alternative dates now. Yes, yeah, yes. I, I don't have my, I don't bring my computer to council meetings, so I don't have my calendar in front of me. Can, can, we don't have to do that. We don't have to do the scheduling here, do we? Right. We can do that. We can have. Christina will help us with that. So, so we'll have staff reach out to you to see for alternative dates. We'll, we'll do that tomorrow, and if we can uh, come on a date that works, then we'll move forward to reschedule. For, for finding a date and time in December that all five of us can get together is a bit challenging, but we probably can do it. Um, Anything else? Ma Mayor and City Council, could I ask, uh, would you like to keep December 10th? I know we're doing that for the CVRA districting process. But do you want to keep the date so we can move the excess interviews for the Measure J and Historic Site Preservation Board and conduct it on that day? If we don't reschedule. I mean, if it would be that night, yes, I can't do it during the day that day. If we change the. If. Mm -hmm. If it's possible to to move it, it, it would help me with a leak of cities meeting. But uh, if that's just not possible, that's not possible. Any other business? Okay, uh, we have a rec we've got to have a request to uh, reconvene to close session just for routine administrative work that we didn't didn't get finished before the meeting. If everyone's in concurrence, shall we adjourn to uh, close session? And and Mayor would also then, just, for, just so we could note that uh, what we would then be doing is, we're going to adjourn to closed session now, but uh, we also would like to then adjourn that meeting uh, to a closed session uh, tomorrow. And I think it was at 5 o'clock, uh, just as a placeholder, because we may need some follow-up. So we'd like to adjourn to a 5 o'clock closed session tomorrow evening in yeah, advance. Because this doesn't say what time. It just says closed session and say what time. Is 5 o'clock going to be? Give us sufficient time tomorrow.
I think whether it gives us time, <laughs> that's the availability. The, the availability of other members. Obviously, we. Thank you. Obviously, we have to have uh, everyone's availability. Uh, but rushing from a closed session into an open session is something that I think we have got to get past. Uh, uh, going from what have frequently been intense closed sessions and having uh, no more than a minute to catch your breath before starting another s a public session, I think is a mistake. So I'd rather start much earlier uh, and make sure that we can fully and completely and adequately convene in closed session and have the time to come back in, uh, to public session uh, sufficiently ready uh, to, uh, to conduct the public's business. And we're not doing that. We are, we are leaving intense public uh, closed session meetings at 559 and rushing in here uh, with barely time to use the restroom before we start a meeting. I just have a procedural question for the public. So when are we gonna report out about this closed session? And if we adjourn into a new closed session tomorrow, when are we gonna report out? Are we gonna come back tonight and report out of this yes. closed session? Yes, and, and I also must say, and so I, I I do realize now there is a closed session scheduled for tomorrow's meeting at 4.30. So, so Mayor, we do not have to adjourn okay. then. Because this, because uh, my, my agenda says to, uh, Preceded by closed session, small conference room. It doesn't say what time. Yes. Yeah, the, the closed close session tomorrow is agendized for 4.30. Not on here. Okay. So, so I think we're set there, but um, we will be reporting out this evening. Right. So we got that today, and I responded. The council member Holstage and I have a 4.30 meeting that we can't change. Um, but we can move. We, I've checked. We can be the first thing on the agenda, and we can make it by 5. So 5 o'clock, first closed session tomorrow? Yes, and actually, let's do it as an adjournment since the noticed closed session is for 4.30. You're, you're free to adjourn exactly as the city manager said, and we're noticing right now that we're just not going to begin at 4.30. Okay. Thanks. The, the closed session is still noticed. It's just we're changing the time. Yes. To later, not earlier. Yes, again. Hey, Anthony, you got all that? Yeah. Okay, so before I, before, I, before I do this, I want to make sure I know what I'm doing. So we're going to adjourn to a special meeting on Thursday, November 29th at 6 o'clock in City Council uh, in Council Chamber at City Hall, preceded by a closed session small conference room at 5 o'clock. Right? Yes. So we are adjourning to closed session. It, it, yes, and we will report out if there's reportable action. If not, we'll report tomorrow. Thank you.